it's a great pleasure to be part of this conference, and I look forward to hearing all of the rest of the talks. What I want to do, um, it was a good question what I should do in this talk, and so I just said, okay, let me start um, <coughs> with what I know best, and it's namely, um, what I'm going to, this is the, the, the distinction here that I want to start with, is a distinction between uh, language in vacuo and language in situ. And let me step out right away what I mean. Is language in situ is something where you have something that's um, immediately anchored to things in your environment, whereas language in vacuo is what we take to be the, the stuff of most linguistic theories, namely the sense of meaning. So let me start with a real example here. <laughs> now, that's all you're going to hear, because in fact, that is already an extremely complicated sentence. I, I'm only going to give you part of it. Should we put this in, she says. And if you look at this, what she did, to understand what she said, what she meant, you have to know who these two people are. That is, they have to know each other. She has to know, or she has to display something. In fact, she displays this utterance. But she also displays certain gestures in the way she faces herself and the way she picks up a cross piece. And she does it in a particular setting. This happens to be an experiment in Jordan Hall at Stanford, um, and it's on a particular time. And they are building, assembling, basically an Ikea like a TV stand. That's what they're doing. So what her purpose is in this particular utterance is to ask uh, Burton about this. Should we put this in? And she does this as a way of proposing what they're going to do next. <coughs> now, uh, the point here is what we have is an utterance that is anchored to a bunch of things in the context, namely the I and the you, the here, now, hereby, and what for of that utterance. And furthermore, I'm going to call these anchors. So something is, uh, and by anchor, I mean this. Um, it's to index an expression. So I can index something by pointing at it. But I have to get you, if your name is Larry Horn, I have to get you to see that I'm pointing at that table. OK. Um, the, index, the things that are indexed in almost every utterance, um, once you start looking at them, include uh, the speaker, the addressee, and, and the way you, the source, the typical index is I'm using the source of the speech, the speaker's eye gaze, for here, the speaker's vocation, uh, the now, the timing of the utterance, hereby is the perceptual and co conceptual content of the utterance itself, which includes the gestures, um, and the purpose which is they are engaged in a particular joint activity. Namely, they're putting, they're assembling this TV stand. Okay, now that contrasts with language in vacuum, uh, where there is no anchoring to anything. This is just a sentence of English. Um, and so there's no anchors. You have no idea who said it to whom. In fact, you don't care. What you really care about is somehow the potential of that sentence has as, a, as something that one could use. So um, I am making this really simple distinction. It's been made for centuries, and it's certainly known to all of the linguists in the room, surely, the difference between an utterance and a sentence. So an utterance is a particular, it's a, a sentence that's produced on a particular occasion, often a sentence anyway. Word uses and communicative acts are, they, have, they always have to have these anchors as opposed to language in vacuum, which uh, sentences, word types, community practices. And the way I'm going to talk about it from now on, however, is this way. That is, I'm interested in speaker's meaning. It's sometimes called speaker meaning, and Grice, our good old friend Grice, called it utterer's meaning. That's way too many syllables, so I'm going to stick with speaker's meaning, as opposed to word or sentence meaning, which is what um, much of us who do linguistics or um, are interested in. Now, I want to make some observations about language in situ because they will play a role in what I go on to say. 
Um, the native setting for language is, or language use in situ, is face-to-case -face conversation. And I just, here's a quotation from Chuck Fillmore, language of face-to-face -face conversation is the basic and primary use of language. All others are best described in terms of their manner of deviation from that base. So here is, uh, the native settings are face-to-face. -face. We have all these display settings. They're perfectly good uses of language. And they are in a certain kind of situ. It's just that they aren't in what I'm going to call the native setting. The native setting is face-to-face. -face. Um, they can be displaced in all these ways. Um, observation two is speaking in a native sentence takes place in a shared physical scene. So by a physical scene, what I mean is a scene in which um, is a configuration space and time of people, objects, and, eat, and actions and events, that kind of, the stuff that in fact is going to be critical for anchoring each utterance. Um, the shared physical scene is a highly accessible part of current common ground, and this is why it is uh, highly, I mean, if you're in a face-to-face -face setting, you're making use of all of that information in your shared physical um, space. Observation three, utterances in native sentences always include gestures, and I mean always. Um, and that's because, of course, you're face-to-face. -face. You have no um, uh, recourse except to use your, the way you're facing each other. So here's Adam Kendall, who I think of as the godfather of gesture research. Gesture is a name for visible action when it uses as an utterance or as part of an utterance. So it will include eye gaze, body posture, uh, positions, uh, as well as hand and facial gestures. So lots of stuff. Um, utterances are either all gestures. In fact, there are many utterances that are simply gestural. And, uh, but many of them are composites, or composites, however you want to pronounce that, of speech and gesture. So here is the example that I gave you. Uh, we have here this gesture goes with we, that gesture goes with this, and without knowing the gesture and the word uh, uttered there, you have no idea what this woman is saying. Okay, observation four. This is the crucial one for something I'll be talking about later. Speaking in native settings is a two-way joint action. So our speakers produce signals um, for their addressees, and in parallel, addressees produce signals for their speakers. Watch this. Notice he made a request by pointing at um, a, a, a pen that she was holding, uh, a screwdriver actually, sorry, a screwdriver, and she then follows this up by doing this. They are both acting at the same time. He's watching her, she knows he, she's watching him, she know, he knows she's watching him and does things so that she can see what he's doing. And she, in her role, does the same thing in the opposite direction. The way I like to think about it is probably like this. The primary signals are produced by a current speaker, someone who would call themselves I in that particular utterance. But these back signals, which are just as important to getting things done there, are produced by the current addressee, in this case, Beth. Um, these primary signals are typically about what you're actually doing, the activity you're engaged in, like assembling a TV stand. Uh, the back signals are produced by the current addressee for talking about the primary signal. That is, they're telling you how much I understand, or do I understand, and here's what I understand of that primary signal. Okay. Um, what then is speaker's meaning? And I'm going to give you this very quick um, and uh, I'm sure inadequate version of, in, I mean, incomplete version, let's put it this way, of um, what speaker's meaning is. In producing this utterance, for example, should we put this in, pointing, uh, here and now, uh, I intend you to recognize what I am doing it for against our common ground. Now, the, the point here really is that fourth line there, that is what you mean. That's what the speakers mean. And, but it takes all of this other stuff to get this done. Okay, so my argument today is uh, that people's primary concern is with speaker's meaning and not meaning in vacuo. 
And this is not something that I just sort of made up on the spot. This is argued in very careful ways by <coughs> Paul Grice long ago. That is, speaker's meaning is first. And speaker's meaning is what you're really after in speaker. That what, you, what we want to call um, uh, meaning in vacuo will come uh, derivative from this in some way. Uh, speakers mean things through a combination of speech and gesture. What I mean for you is based on our current common ground. Uh, our current common ground consists of readily acceptable parts of the initial common ground. That is the common ground that these two people came in to do this uh, activity with and the accumulation of stuff that they have done in the activity so far. And here is a point that I'm going to try to make again and again in this talk, that much of what we think of as meaning, in speaker's meaning, is inevitable. <coughs> it's not something that you can actually express in words. Okay, I'm going to break up this talk into two parts. Um, the first is about something that in some ways we all know a lot about. We think, and I'm going to try to disabuse you of that notion. The second part is about the meaning that's actually produced or made use of as you actually speak in the moment. And so both of these have to do with meaning in the moment. Now, symbolic, I'm going to start with symbolic expressions and let me make this point. This is the easy part. All of you guys know how to do this stuff. And it's not a big problem, I'm guessing. Um, so let's take the word dog. We, this is a bunch of conventional meanings of the word dog, and you look this up in the dictionary and we say, okay, um, suppose you say, gee, I saw a dog. I mean, what the hell do you mean? Well, you mean apparently one of these, um, these senses, and you're supposed to pick out the right sense. So here's, uh, I saw a dog running down the street, but you have no idea which dog or what kind of dog it is without more specification. Or, I saw a dog in Bibby's bedroom. That was for Sue here. Um, these, so these are all dogs, Sue, but of course they aren't dogs. These are toy dogs, or fake dogs, or something like that. Um, the second, so, so there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot more I can say here, so I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> There is an old study that Eve Clark and I did years ago um, in 79 on denominal verbs, novel denominal verbs. And the interesting part about them is that they force you to think way beyond these conventional meanings. So here are a bunch of examples. The woman was segwaying down the street. We LL'd from Tel Aviv to San Francisco. Um, Helen unicycled up to the audience. Um, we littered it into all the, all the trash. These, we find these, I was just reading the novel on the way here, and there are these things all the way through the novel. I mean, this is not a trivial thing. This is a trivial thing to do. Um, the boy porched the newspaper. Uh, today I'm going gallery. So that's, uh, a, 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 that comes from, these come from places, and these come from vehicles, and even I have this classification of about, I would say, a thousand, two thousand of these examples um, that all fit into a bunch of small categories, except all of them require you to know something beyond the conventional meaning of the word. So they're not in the dictionary, so how do we create the sentences on the senses on the fly? Here's another set of expressions that uh, Richard Garrett, who was an undergraduate at this institution, uh, and I uh, studied at one point. Um, here's an example. My sister Houdini her way out of the locked garage. That's a denominal verb. Uh, but the third one down is the one that I'm going to start with. So the photographer asked me to do a Napoleon for the camera. A small boy and a girl came past close to me doing in Indianapolis on their tricycles. <laughs> Now, this is from a novel by Evil Tell Me, um, Dick Francis, Dick Francis. Uh, the Amazing Randy did a thorough Houdini of Madame Sharon's seance. 
uh, Hitler did in Napoleon when he tried to defeat the Russians at Stalingrad. Uh, you could even say suburb of Napoleon here. The point here is that these are all derived from, uh, from proper nouns, and proper nouns in the classical sense do not have senses. You can't say that the word Herb Clark, for example, has a sense. It's, it's just something that refers to me directly. These, this is one of the, the old theories. <coughs> Actually, it depends on which language you talk to about exactly how you want to account for these things. It is not trivial. You have to know the history of Napoleon, Houdini, and Indianapolis uh, to even remotely figure out what these words mean. And that has to be part of your common ground. Now, uh, I'm going to get rid of this, this issue here very quickly because this is not the main issue I'm going to focus on here. But I'm going to give you four examples and so that you can see these are real problems. So here's the first one. So radish and vacuole has these two conventional senses, those two. Uh, so if someone said, hand me a radish, you would hand them one of these little, all those things. The trouble is that I was in a checkout line at the supermarket, and the clerk said, do you have one or two radishes there? Now, what did he mean? Well, he meant a bunch of radishes. Now, he could see that I, I had more than one. I mean, he could see that I had more than one, but there were a bunch of them. But he couldn't figure out how many bunches I had. So, in fact, I said two. And how did he come to that? How did he happen to use the, that expression, expecting me to be able to figure this out? That's the question for you. Um, here's another example. Zero in vacuo has three senses. So it, it means not a freezing temperature or a non-entity. These are at least simple conventional versions of this. On standard accounts, if we so it's zero out, we'd say, ah, it's freezing out. OK. However, in 1980, the San Francisco called 411 on the telephone, this is uh, information, sort of, uh, you guys don't know about information anymore, but <laughs> using information, and asked for total information. And the operator at 411 demurred and said, I don't know, you'll have to ask a zero. Now, what is a zero? It's a person you would get by dialing zero. So you do the whole zero, and then you can ask that person. Um, but you can't ask the person at 411. Now, a zero surely doesn't mean this. In, there's no conventional meaning that, for which this is true. Um, here is one that I heard just literally two days ago. If you want to lighten your load a bit, but you don't want to feed a landfill, what's the best thing to do? Well, the number one thing to remember is you really want to do everything you can to keep your clothing item in use as a garment. You want to rehome it. You want to rehome it. Do people say rehome now? Well, well, I'm saying it. Yes. You <laughs> I don't care whether you say it, but I just say it. Um, now, the, this last one is for Sue, and she may be the only pe person in this room who knows all of these folks, these two folks. How many people know both Chris and Pat Soupies? Uh, so there's there's one. So you, you're missing what is really the interesting part of the story. Right? <laughs> um, so Chris Soupies uh, was struggling to get into a passenger side of a low slung sports car. A friend overheard this exchange between Chris and Pat. The friend is uh, Ed Smith, um, who happened to be sitting right there. And so he he of course knew we were doing stuff like this, and he said, "Oh, what do you mean, uh, Pat?" Could you please do a Chomsky for me? Now do a Chomsky. For anybody in this room, this has got to be exotic. Um, but it, the explanation is a week before, Chris and Pat had, been ta had taken Chomsky out for dinner. And Chomsky had been this very polite person. He'd come around and he'd help uh, open the car door for Chris and help her get in. And so later, they talked about this. And Chris was really impressed by this and said, Pat. Uh, would you please, could you please do a Chomsky for me? I suppose he did. At least that's maybe the report. Anyway, um, so 
the meaning of sy symbolic uh, sy expression of situ is based on the conventional sense. It's almost always based on some conventional sense, except for these um, eponymous uh, things. It's created at the moment on um, basis of the common ground, but what the speaker really meant, in fact, it's not clear what, for example, Dua Chomsky meant in this last example, or many of these other examples. Uh, there is something, part of it at least, that's inevitable. Okay, that's the easy example, so let me go on to a harder example. Um, these are deictic expressions. We all know about deictic expressions. I say to Larry, I say, that table is handsome. Um, now, we all know dikesis. There's dikesis all over the place. Uh, there's place dikesis, time dikesis, social dikesis, and definite reference, but so di time dikesis would be something like now, yesterday. These are expressions that depend on the context. You cannot interpret them without looking at the context, is that's the way they're defined. Um, and if you notice, these were the indexicals that I talked about in my first. Uh, these are the things that you use to index things as a way of anchoring an utterance. But uh, this is a, an old this is an old work by David Kaplan and uh, John Perry arguing that every deity expression is really a symbol index composite. So if you take up that pair, so she's picking up the board and saying this. Um, you're doing your to get this right, you have to look at those two parts, the symbol and the index, and as long as you combine them, you can figure out what it is that she is saying. Now, uh, let me give you a really simple <coughs> example of an index. Um, he is looking, that's me, uh, he is pointing at a copy of Shakespeare. Um, so I'm saying that book costs ten dollars. There's an index in there. There's a thing that's indicated in the cartoon, um, and it's basically we do it this way. Now you think, okay, this is really simple. However, um, how about that man was indecisive? Now who does that man refer to? Well, this is a uh, book of Hamlet, of course. Uh, I'm. I'm pointing at the physical book. The physical book indexes the, uh, the realization of the play Hamlet, and that indexes Hamlet himself. And so you can say that perfectly well. Um, but notice, uh, so there's a chain of indexes here, and you can get these chains that just go wildly off the page um, to get to the reference. But let me give you another one. So I can say that man was a genius. That man, same word, now is, of course, uh, um, Shakespeare. So the way you get to the the, uh, the referent uh, depends on the set of indexes that you set up, and that can be uh, they have to be constructed on the fly in, in a particular situation. So here is an actual experiment that we did way back in 1982. Um, these are two people, David Stockman, you've never heard of, unless your name is Sue. Um, and, and Larry will have heard of him. Um, and Ronald Reagan, you all know who this is. So what we, this is a guy named Sam Buffett. He would go walk up to somebody on the Stanford campus, hand them the picture and say, a fo this photograph, literally this photograph, and say one of two things. Do you, you know who this man is, don't you? And they would say, of course I do. It is Reagan. Uh, do you have any idea at all who this man is? And they would say, sure, uh, it's Stockman. Now, here is, in fact, the statistics on this. Um, as you see, uh, it's Reagan, or yes, it's Reagan, if for, you know who this man is, don't you? So 93% of the time, they're picking out Reagan. But for this one, they're picking out Stockman. Now, what Patrick did immediately was to say, OK, who are these two people? <coughs> Everybody knew both of them. So it wasn't that they were unknown. It was that they expected you to, because of these presuppositions, to think of Reagan as someone you're supposed to know and Stockman as someone you're not supposed to know. Here's another example to show you the indexing problem. This is uh, some work by Nick Enfield. 
um, in Lao. So this woman is being asked, where is your house? And she says, uh, she doesn't say anything, actually. She lip points. Now, lip pointing is used all over the world, uh, except, of course, in crazy places like the US. Um, so what is this lip pointing doing? Lip pointing doesn't tell you anything. Lips just don't point at anything. <laughs> so as uh, Nick Enfield pointed out, this is really a double index. She says the lip point, he, this is his argument, the lip point is a signal saying, I'm now indicating something to you by looking at it. So what you're supposed to do is, if I go like this, you're supposed to watch my eyes. And my eyes are telling you what it is that I'm indicating. So this is, they're right in the signal itself, there's this double index, and you can't do it without that. Okay, so this is the meaning of dietic expressions. The point I want to make here that is the record of a dietic expression is often ineffable. That is, you can't say, you couldn't have described it. I can't say, oh, my house is the one that is, um, and then you go into this crazy description of where it is, but you can point at it and you know that it's an answer to the question, where do you live? Now, perform depictions are my favorite because I've just been working on them. <laughs> and, but they are the hardest case for you in this room, I'm going to argue. Um, so here is, uh, um, I'm going to start with printed utterances. So in printed utterances, depictions can be embedded, indexed, adjunct, or adjoined, or independent of the utterance that they are, they are a part of. So let's take the embedded cases. Here is my favorite because this is uh, Magritte. And as you know, it means the what the sun is hidden by the clouds. Notice if it was hidden by the clouds, why should you be able to see it? But there is this depiction showing this perfectly visible. Um, but this is being used as a noun. I want you to keep track of these things. This is being used as a noun. Here's another one that's being used as a, an embedded noun. Again, this is um, French, in case you couldn't get your French. Um, this is an embedded noun for, so please remove your, apparently, shoes or footwear or something like that. Um, the next one is indexed. So I want you, that I is indexed, is, uh, is indexed, sorry, that depiction is indexed by the word I. You know who I is by looking at the depiction, and of course you have to know who the viewer is to get this right. Um, by the way, that's true of this one here. Please remove your shoes. Now, the your means the person who's looking at this. Um, it's not just any you. It's the your of the person who's reading this at the moment. Um, now, adjunct ones. I have, uh, these I found down by the beach uh, in California. So please leave your foot, footwear outside. So here, the depiction is not embedded. It's a joint to the word footwear here, and there are a bunch of them here. I've got them all, and the thing is, they are not all shoes, or at least you wouldn't say they're shoes. I mean, these are flip-flops, and they're women's shoes, and not men's shoes, and the thing down at the bottom is a boot, and it's not a shoe at all. So are you supposed to leave your boots out, but not your shoes or your flip-flops? Um, we know better than that. Um, independent depictions are like this. You see this, and you know this is a woman's room. This is a men's room, and that's a room for changing diapers, and that's a room for changing diapers. You don't have to have anything but the depiction itself to signal what's going on. Okay, so let me take a really simple case. A woman is riding a horse. This is a description. This is a depiction. What the hell is the difference between these two? This, to me, is the big question here I'm going to come back to. Um, so the challenge is, when I say there was a... Uh, in the parade today, <laughs> you're supposed to figure out what that is. It's an embedded noun. It's being treated as an embedded noun, but you don't want to say uh, it means woman riding a horse, or a horse with a woman on it, or a horse and a woman. You have no idea, without something else, uh, what, what actually might be a possible expression. Now, 
That's okay for these, that, this sort of thing, but now I'm going to go to perform depictions. And these are really exotic because you're going to have serious trouble with this. And I'm going to call this the really hard case. And, but we find exactly the same uh, examples that I gave you before. Let me start with an embedded one. And you would go by his office and hear, well, I can see you Wednesday at 3 o'clock. <laughs> Now notice, this is a quotation, just a simple-minded quotation, but it's an embedded noun phrase, so. But notice how this was all enacted. This was a kind of a lovely demonstration of, a, of what this crazy guy that he used to know said. Uh, here's another one. But D has this little in it, which is so nice. So this is an embedded noun phrase. This one is an embedded noun. These are two depictions of things having to do with music, um, but they are depictions, and they're just stuck in this sentence. Without any problem here, here's an He could have written, fine. Um, and again, we have an embedded noun phrase here. Yeah, you can go out to dinner with some friends, and all of a sudden I hear this, bang, 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 you know? So here, she's saying, I hear this bang, 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 and she's depicting a, an event of uh, some shooting that's going on. There are five bangs, and they're in a particular rhythm, and she does it with raising her voice. That's a depiction, but it's treated as an embedded noun. This, and then she gives you the whole noun. Um, you know, it was very, very easy to tell the difference because the was gone out of this, you know? Now, here, this is. I love this. It was, very, you know, it was very, very easy to tell the difference because the was gone out of it. You know? Here is a gesture by itself that's treated as a noun in this sentence right here. In this utterance here. Um, okay, let me now give you some index cases. I am now Mozart. Forgive the immodesty. This is what I want to write. <laughs> How can I do it? So what he has done here is he's playing a piano. That's a depiction of something that Mozart wrote uh, or would want to write. And he is indexing with the word this. Now that's the way he gets it into this discourse. Without that this and without his depiction, that wouldn't happen. Here's another one. At the University of Illinois, where I used to teach, there was a voice professor who said, you should always speak like this. You know? By the way, that's the preliminary to the previous one that you heard before. But notice, this is kind of a fusion of the raised voice with dramatic gestures with his own just sentence. And this is just the sentence that he was going to utter anyway. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an index depiction that's indexed with like this. Here's another one. You no, know, here's an adjunct. Now, diminuendo doesn't mean from fortissimo to pianissimo. It means simply what we would call the tapering. Now, what he's doing is giving you a depiction with this expression, what you would call the tapering. You could get rid of his, his depiction and it would still make sense. The whole sentence would make sense. He, what he's doing is giving you something of you know, what we would call the tapering. He's giving you a depiction of it while he's giving you the utterance. <laughs> Um, so, this is called the affiliate, and that's called the adjunct depiction. He's got his various brushes, he's got his colors, and he's got his strokes, that's it. That's all we've got. So, here's just a bunch of these things, a bunch of uh, gestures done with his uh, sentences, and they all are adjunct depictions. Um, now, the final example has to do with it. I'm, or what I'm going to call ad independent um, depictions. And My friend Gary really talked me into it. Come on, we got to audition together, we got to be on it together. And I was kind of like, whatever, you know? And um, this is California here. I don't care. <laughs> but notice that there is no he said here, whatever. It's she's just giving this as an independent part, the next part, the independent part of her discourse. Um, on the other hand, this is embedded. So she's treating that as an embedded part, but yet not the other one. Here's Malcolm Bilson again. Well, Mozart has done everything to show you that this is extremely light execution. 
So he doesn't say Mozart did or Mozart wrote. He just gives you the whole thing, having described it in the previous utterance. Okay. Um, well, Mozart has done. So the meaning of a depiction in situ. This I have struggled with this for ten years. So if you, if anybody in this audience comes up with an immediate um, answer to this, I will be really angry. <laughs> uh, the meaning of a depiction depends on whether it is embedded, indexed, adjunct, or independent. Uh, yes, those those four is based on the speaker's staging in the scene. Notice that what uh, Bilson did in every one of these cases is stage a scene. That is what Mozart would have written or what this guy would have said. Um, and these are in the common ground of the speaker and the adversary at that moment. They have to be highly accessible at that moment. But here's the problem for me. They're generally ineffable. That is, if you try to figure out what would be a description that would fit into that utterance that would do the same thing that Malcolm Wilson's uh, depictions would do. You can't find them. They aren't there. Um, that is, it was very, very easy to tell the difference because the was gone out of it. You know? Now, no one in, that you know of has ever said, is a noun. That's just not a noun. So then the question is, what are these things? Let me just say, if you think that these are rare faults, they're all over the place, in, especially in stories that people tell. Um, anyway, that is what I want to say about expressions. And I now want to turn to the meaning of actions in real time. And this is a real change from what I've just been talking about. Um, uh, on the other hand, it's another hard case. And I'm going to try to argue get you to believe that it is a hard case. So um, I'm going to start with something that I have called the commitment principle. That is, for a speaker to produce an utterance is to make a commitment to addressees that takes effect uh, at the start of an utterance. So notice, he, this is an utterance. What he's doing is offering this thing to her. And uh, so there's no commitment until he does the offer. He makes this. He holds out this peg, and then there, there's an offer from then on. There's, but there was no offer before that time. So the time at the beginning of the others, in this case a gesture, um, is a way of telling, making a commitment that starts at that moment. The problem is that commitments like this are provisional. And uh, so in native settings, every commitment is considered provisional until it's secured. I should, um, let me get this so you really know. Until it is secured by joint closure. I'm going to uh, hit that and let you know about all of this in a minute. Uh, I'm going to take data from an old experiment by <coughs> Crick and myself, in which uh, the people were sitting at the two ends of the table. So. This may not look like it, but that guy is at one end of the table and the other guy is at the other end of the table and looking at each other. This guy has a prototype and this guy, he's telling the other guy how to put it, how to make the prototype, how to make a model of that prototype. Okay. Do you want a 2 by 2 the other one? Or, uh, yeah, do 2 by 2 the other one. And, uh, I mean a 4 by 2 the other one. Sorry. And a four by two, three, one. Okay, let me do this again, and I'm going to show you all the provisional things that this guy did in saying what he said. Okay. You want a two by two, yellow one? Uh, like I said, yeah, do two by two, yellow one. And, uh, I mean, a four by two, yellow one. Sorry. And a four by two, three, one. Okay. Notice uh, these. Uh, oh, shut up, shut up. All of these things that he did in the middle there, he dropped. They were not, uh, they were not part of his eventual utterance. They are just provisional things that he did on the way. And it's pretty easy to see what he was doing. 
he was revising um, and having various temporary things, and he abandoned a bunch of things as he went along. But it, this is made permanent at this bottom pair of utterances where he was getting joint closure, what I call it joint closure on this. So uh, why is he doing this? And the ar argument here is that there is a cognitive bottleneck between top-down analysis, <coughs> namely what I want to do and should, uh, there's a time that I should be producing some utterance, but then there's, I can't do it in that time, so I have to um, do something else to uh, deal with that problem. And the problems are obstacles and opportunities. I, there are a bunch of obstacles. I can't think of a word. Um, I'm having trouble uh, finding the, the best way to look at this object, whatever. And there are opportunities. I'll show you annotate signals. Uh, that's what he <coughs> did in various points, and he abandoned the signal. So in the case that I just showed you, these are revisions, these are annotations, and those are cases that were simply abandoned. Okay, now I want to start, I, I want to give you a bunch of cases here quickly uh, that give you this kind of uh, sense here. Um, so Peter says, and he's going to go to the top, is he? And now, listen to this answer. Well, I mean this, uh, Mallet said, Mallet was, uh, said something about, uh, you know, he felt it would be a good thing if, uh, if Oscar went. Now, the, this is just another academic, just like all of most of us, um, saying, trying to say what they want to say and having trouble doing it. <laughs> um, so what you see here are, uh, I'm gonna put this here, there's, uh, the guy starts out well, and then he says, I mean, and then he initiates this assertion, so this. This is, he's going to say something, this. But in fact, he re immediately replaces this with Mallet said, Mallet said with Mallet was, was with something, said something about, then he replaced, Mallet said something about what he felt would be a good thing if, and then he replaced if with if Oscar went. This is just, now I, I have a nice, Hunters here, this is all in the single one. These are all over the place in ordinary, everyday conversations. <coughs> this is what I mean by um, uh, provisional. So speakers use uh, repair phrases to, to signal revision. So like, I mean, um, sorry, no, and excuse me, uh, they use the, so he is interested in the. Um, uh, when you come to look at the, the literature, I mean, you know, the actual statements, the versus the, you can do this in English, the always signals, um, I'm committing to a definite NP, I'm making some commitment, but I'm suspending speech right after the the. And let me show you one. I think the, the, the government should, I think the, the, the government should so I think the, and he suspends speaking after the. But then he produces the, saying, you know, I'm going to give this definite NP right now. <laughs> um, but he suspends after the, um, because he doesn't have it ready yet. And then finally, he does get it ready, and then he produces it. So if you look at how often people suspend speaking after the, it's 81% of the time versus 7% of the time after the. Uh, if, and they even repeat the, the, only 2% of the time, they repeat the, the, 34% of the time. Now, the other way to deal with uh, delays is to um, do what Bill Bush is going to do here. That was a tragic moment. Um, actually, Mr. Vice President, it's not true. I, I, I do support a National Patients Bill of Rights. So, in producing um, Bush meant, I am initiating a repair starting with um, and, it, and, uh, and, it, it, and so then the question is, how do we know this? Well, this is Jeannie Foxtree and I did work showing that us signals minor delays and um signals major delays. Um, and here is, these are delays that are, so uh and um are different already in how much delay they have. But people have it. They extend the delay beyond 29% uh, of the time and after. Um, 
61% of the time. There's a, long, a much longer story here that I'm not going to tell you. Um, people use the uh, and notice that this is, for those phonologists in the room, this is a trochee. The uh, is formulated as a trochee as opposed to the uh. You can't get the uh as a trochee, you have to get the uh. And there is a Y that's stuck in there. Um, and here is good old. And it was not just the world, it was the discipline of working, and it was the uh, structure it gave to my life. So the uh, she says, uh, as, uh, and these are all over the place too. Um, I'm not going to give you this experiment, which is a nice experiment, um, but you can also do prolongations to signal, signal space, uh, pace, pacing. Um, I'm going to give you just, uh, uh, let me give you just a few. This is Susan, but it's not, this is our Susan here. Um, so here's a woman named Susan who, there she's looking at a, at a, a blueprint of a, of a house. And she's saying, and this up here, these are blank rooms. And he says, mm -hmm. and she says, so. But now watch what she does with her finger. Okay. And this here, these are blank rooms. Hold, 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 hold. Mm -hmm. So. And then as soon as he says, mm -hmm, she lifts her finger. That is, uh, she's holding this point until he says, mm -hmm. And this is a full 2.6 seconds. It's a hell of a long time in speech. And she does it because this is what she's trying to do. She's initiating a delay, sorry, a hold. Uh, what is she trying to do with this initiation maintenance and termination? She is, with the initiation scene, I now want you to attend to this room, maintenance appointing as I want to continue. I continue to want you point to uh, attend to this room, and the termination is I now consider getting your attention to be complete. So these are ways of using the very tiny <coughs> gesture to do all of this work here. Um, and here is one more. So where in the hell did this yes come from? Well, it comes from... So what he did was to index the reference that she was making at that moment, and she then had to say yes before she went on. Uh, so this is the way to look at it and put it on the right hand half of the, and then uh, he poised this block where he was about to go, and she says yes, and then she finishes her part. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, what to conclude? So I've given you two very different sorts of things here. One of them is uh, has to do with expressions. And so what speakers mean varies with the type of expression, symbolic, didactic, and performative, perform depictions. Uh, the speaker's meaning in all these cases eventually, or in many of these cases, is ineffable. That is, you cannot replace it with a description of any kind. And this is a real problem if you think that logic only works with descriptions of some kind. And certainly, it's a problem for psychologists to know what the hell is it that is being is being denoted with these um, with these expressions? Uh, and you make provisional commitments segment by segment. Uh, you may add delays, annotations, and once you produce a segment, they may, you may retain it, revise it, abandon it. The point here is that uh, your goal is to reach joint closure with your adversary uh, about these commitments. So that's it.